I'm your host, Ann Kelly. Today, we are here with my friend, Daniel. Daniel is a photographer and I cannot pronounce his last name. So I'm gonna let him do that for us. Thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Welcome. Gonçalves, or Gonçalves, Americanized version. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna try that, but I knew I was gonna I was gonna butcher it, so we just thought we'd let you go for it. You would not be the first. I've gotten all kinds of stuff. My French teacher used to call me Gong Calves. I've got <laughs> Gong Clays. For some reason, people call me David as well. I don't know why David. I don't get that. Even on my signature, it'll be like signed Daniel Gonzalez, and I'll be like, Hey, David. I'm like what? Who's David? So that's my <laughs> alter ego, David. And then I started like, okay, I'm gonna make a cheat sheet. So on my business card, on the other side, I have like, you know, the C sounds like an S because it's got that little little squiggly line, which makes C sound like an S, the Sabita. And then um, someone's like, you know, how do you pronounce your name? I'm like, I got this. So I pulled it out. I'm like, here you go. You can keep it. And they're like looking at it like, okay, I get it. Gone slaves. Which is probably oh God, so the best the I would have done. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I got a new mispronunciation now. So your your name your last name is Portuguese, and you are from Canada, or Canada is where you were born. I was born in Toronto, in Little Portugal, uh, where my parents had a little Portuguese supermarket. So I was very ingrained in the Portuguese community there. I kind of ten times more Portuguese than I was growing up. It was just like I mean, people you could live your whole life in Toronto and not speak a word of. English as a Portuguese person. I mean, I did not know that. And you're yeah. in LA now. Which... LA-ish, Orange County. But yeah, I say LA because people don't know where Irvine is. They're like, or who? LA. <laughs> oh, Hollywood stars? Yes. Okay, got it. <laughs> like, this is my last name and I live in LA. Yes. <laughs> right. And there you go. <laughs> Gone slaves and LA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your family owned this, what was, like a little supermarket, right? Or yeah, it was a Bon Appetit supermarket. It felt big growing up. It was pretty small. It was like a little mom and pop shop, and we had we ended up like buying a little bakery across the street, the Portuguese bakery there. So, within your photography, you've always been interested in identity and culture, and American culture is something that's popped up repeatedly, and so we we see a bit of that uh, within two of the bodies of work that are featured on your website. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about a new body of work uh, that's not yet on your website. So, so that's mm -hmm. kind of exciting. Do you wanna go into um, kind of the connections between all of those things a little bit? Sure, yeah. So like, like I was saying, I was, was always kind of like fascinated with America growing up. I felt like this place of opportunity and I don't know, so it wasn't Portuguese. I was trying to run away from like this identity of being Portuguese growing up because it's like everybody in your school is Portuguese and everyone's got smelly sardines for lunch. And of course, and to I, me, it sounds super cool. But when you're a yeah. kid, you're just stupid sure. and you don't really think about like how special the situation is that you're in and how unique it is. Um, but you always want what you can't have. So anyway, like that's always kind of stuck with me. Like, what does it mean to be American? Like, how, what is America? Like, all these different things and is it cool to be American or what is it like do you talk differently do you what is it right so that's what's been kind of a fascination of what it means to be American and then kind of while becoming an American citizen I kind of had to go through that transformation and um yeah and, and also just kind of like this triple identity of like being Canadian Portuguese and American now because it's like when I go to Portugal I'm the Canadian right when I'm in Canada I'm the American Mm -hmm. And when I'm in America, I'm the Canadian, so it's like I don't really belong anywhere, which is always kind of awkward. And I always get blamed for things. It's like you know, if I'm in Portugal, it's cold here. It's your fault because you're Canadian. You know, when I go to Canada, like you know, Bush was in, was president at the time, and you know, my friends would give me crap. They'd be like, "It's your fault." You know, look what look what this morons doing. I'm like, I can't even vote, man. You can't blame me for this. It's like it's your country. I'm like, I'm not even a citizen. You can't blame me for this. So I don't know. Just kind of, and also kind of how when you like when my parents came from Portugal to Canada, how you kind of brought your culture with you and like the supermarket, but it changes because then it's like you got your, you know, your American stuff, Canadian stuff, North American stuff. You have your Portuguese kind of stuff. People are coming in that aren't from where you're from. It's just kind of how things kind of morph. 
even though you bring things. And like when we came to America, I actually opened up a bakery in Florida, much smaller Portuguese population. Toronto's got a huge Portuguese population. Um, so now you're like, okay, well, I need to cater to this community, but it's a tiny community. So how do I cater to the American palate and introduce them to something that they've never heard of mm-hmm. and also give them like kind of American names. So that would oh. make sense. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, kind of exotic, but you can relate to it as well. Yeah. Kind of, it's like yeah. Portuguese cookie. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that sounds exciting. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've always kind of used photography. It seems like to explore things that, that you're curious about, but what I don't know is when you started making photographs, how you got into photography, what, what that story is about. I've always loved photography. It's always been kind of like this weird passion for me. I don't know why. I wasn't like the family documentary in. We used to have like a big VHS camera that weighed like 30 pounds. I would always be carrying it around like in grade school. I thought it was so cool. Yeah. Um, image civilization was like this huge like lens. I would like move inside of it. It was like a big square thing. I was like, this thing's so compact. Look at it. It's like a big boom box. <laughs> and um, but I used to love it and like uh, in grade eight, I was really into it. And like at the time, my best friend, Victor, we had done like a school project on it and it did really well. And we like one little, like a little regional award and stuff for project of the year. And I was really into it. We're developing, super sketchy developing photos in my parents' basement or on the supermarket's basement. And we didn't even know what we were doing. I think we like, we're inventing like processes that we didn't realize. We were using like projectors. So, like we, we, we couldn't figure out how to develop it. So we would like just sear the, the images onto paper for like two hours and then bring it out and just like it would eventually just become an image <laughs> without any chemicals. I don't even know where all that stuff is. But anyway. You were um, in it and you were going for it. Right, exactly. And I loved it. And my mom, smart woman that she is and Portuguese she is, I wanted to get a um, an SLR camera, which my friend Victor got one for his birthday or Christmas, or whatever it was. My mom's like, Mm-mm, you're going to medical school. No way. <laughs> you're not going to get a camera. So um, so I didn't get a camera. So I always had like a little point and shoot. But it was always kind of like this like passion. Then when I was in college, I um, secretly bought a camera. The one you knew about. Like my first, uh, I don't know, like some sketchy camera dude, like near USF. He's like, yeah, come over to my apartment. I'll sell you a camera. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I bought like a little Olympus. It was OM10. I love that thing with like a 50 millimeter, like 1.8 lens on it. And I just started shooting pictures. And and then I'd like go on AOL and post like ads, like model portfolios, like, you know, because I just wanted to like shoot stuff. And then like, you know, like 10 bucks or something. Mm-hmm. So, and then like, I saved up a little bit of money, bought my first enlarger, and then like set up that up. And then we just experiment with stuff in my parents basement when I go home for the summer and then all my stuff all my old black and white like lab stuff I don't know where it is it's in some dumpster somewhere my mom like emptied out the basement and mm. everything all my gear everything I was like what are, what the pictures like what pictures oh right because you were yeah taking photos on yeah. the down low. And then more seriously, um, when things started changing, like in 2008, I started getting a bit more interested in it because at the time I was running the bakery, I had a restaurant, I was a, uh, was in real estate, I was a mortgage broker, I was doing all this different stuff and the market was collapsing around me. And I'm just like, I don't know. And at the time, Magda and I just got married and uh, she was like, what would you do if you didn't care about money? Like, what would be the one thing you would do? I'm like, photography but how the hell do you make money photography I'm still trying to work that out but that was like the thing that I've always been passionate about that's the thing that's kind of like always stuck with me well but that's a great yeah, like photography. Though, that probably everybody should ask themselves what what would you you know what do you really want to do if if money is not a factor yeah so. and like what else can you do that gets into like people's lives in an intimate way like mm-hmm. I guess you could be first responder or something like ambulance dude (laughs) but I mean just if you're curious about something it's like you got this little magic box and you can go into their lives and ask some questions that you'd be normally too afraid to ask and Mm -hmm. I don't know you get to like kind of really see people and listen to them and understand them and I don't know it's really cool but but what an awesome supportive wife that you have to ask that question at all yeah she's awesome 
and she's quite artistic too. She does all kinds of cool stuff. She does she plays it down, but she's like does little, little paintings and stuff, and she's cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And I asked her the question, question too. I'm like, I've I've kind of pushed her all along too. I'm like, when we met, I was like kind of the more successful one. She was kind of still doing the PhD stuff, and mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what makes you happy? Because at the time she was in academia, and she was just like burnt out, just always stressed out. And then somehow she kind of found her path too. But um, yeah, it's all kind of a path. It's like, I think when I was younger, I thought like you pick this one thing, you could do it. And it's like, it hasn't worked that way at all. It's like, you kind of pick that one thing and then it's like, all right, then you pivot and do something else. Moving to Florida and opening a bakery and that, and then here you are now. And it's um, like, like I tend to say, it's, it's all connected. So I was, I was um, looking at your website this morning and I was rereading your artist statement and um, there was something that caught my attention that I really liked, which you had mentioned the intersection of masculinity and vulnerability. And then I was just also curious how it kind of manifested in your work. I just kind of noticed like when I'm like, you know, when you first start shooting, you're just kind of like doing stuff and you don't really know what you're doing. You kind of process it later as you kind of like have some time to play with it and, sure. and to develop and to start new projects, start noticing this trend trends. So I'm like, I keep on like photographing these things that are like super hyper masculine mm -hmm. or like the topics are and that are kind of like, but they're all kind of or leave the people that are in it very vulnerable as well. So it's kind of like this like pounding your chest thing like guns or bullfighting or whatever. And then it's like, but it's like these are all things that can kill you. And like the perceived like safety of them or the perceived bravado of it versus like the reality of it as well. I don't know, I kind of found that. And then it's like, well, how about the women? It's like, I think it's everything. I think men and women both have masculine and feminine inside of them, right? Like whoever it is. I mean, we all kind of go through different ebbs and flows of it. You know, sometimes we cry, sometimes we yell, sometimes we do whatever, but it's all kind of, maybe it's testosterone, estrogen, whatever it is, but it's just kind of, it's interesting. It's like a lot of these people that are really tough or that, you know, I was initially afraid of, like you find this kind of tender side to them at some point. And it seems to be a common thread. And when you start yeah. interacting with people, which is yeah. kind of the natural part of your, your photographic process in being able to interact with people in a different way where you maybe kind of get to get below the surface a little bit more where maybe you're photographing somebody who seems a little bit threatening but you're interacting with them and you're kind of going okay this is who this person is and this is why they're they're doing that and it's funny because i'm quite neutral i think back then my wife makes fun of me a lot she's like you really are neutral you really can never like make a decision you're always kind of like in the middle like with people i always think of people as like everyone starts off good so mm -hmm. somebody does something that i perceive as bad it's like is that person, does that make that person bad? Like, wh why did, why, right? Like, why do they do that? Or why does it look like they're doing something bad? So it's like, is it just the perception of what people say about that person or whatever? So it's like, I want to kind of like get in there and try to understand who that person is. It's like, is it just because we came up from different backgrounds? Is it because we have different religions? Is it because we come from different parents? It's like, maybe it's a lack of education or actually I'm, I'm not educated on something or whatever, right? Sure. So it's kind of, um, I don't know. It's just kind of about understanding that. No, and, and, and I actually, I think that makes a lot of sense in, in spending some time with your work. I, I think I can actually see that you're approaching people kind of with that neutral perspective. Maybe there are people you don't, you didn't know, you probably wouldn't have known if you weren't photographing them, right? Yeah, and you're right. so I think just interacting with people kind of without that um, initial perceived judgment. This is what this person, I mean, it's, it's a very honest approach to part of your photographing them is kind of figuring who is this person, what are they about, and you're not entering with that preconceived notion. Well, okay, you can't really. I mean, there's maybe. I, I don't know how I feel about the person. But I, I understand my feelings in terms of fear. Like I'll, fear is real, right? So if I see someone with a gun, for example, mm -hmm. that's, I'm fearful towards that. I'm like, is this person gonna harm me? Like, sure. and my brain is automatically firing off. Like this person wants to hurt somebody. It's like, mm -hmm. so that's what I'm coming in with it, right? And then it's like, the more you get to know the people and you understand like what the motivations are or whatever, I'm like, oh, I'm an idiot. Why would I think that this, 
person would want to just harm me just because they could or, or whatever. In talking about the guns, there's a photographic project about that. And um, you had kind of an interesting childhood story surrounding that. So we had this Portuguese supermarket and um, I wasn't in the store at the time. I was upstairs where we lived. But my mother and sister actually held up a gunpoint when I was probably grade seven or grade eight. So my sister's probably grade five, grade six. And we're so Portuguese that we were held up in Portuguese. <laughs> The, the, the two dudes were Portuguese, did oh. not hold up in English. So they actually, like, my mom thought it was a carnival, tried grabbing his masks, thought it was funny because it was a Portuguese carnival. Oh, no. And uh, the guy, and he said in Portuguese, this isn't a joke, it's an assault, and grabbed her and threw her on the ground, my mom's handicap. And um, and then when he threw her on the ground, she, he kind of like, he was like, oh crap, I just, the Portuguese in them is like, I just threw like somebody's mom on the ground, basically, who's handicapped. And when they went over to like hesitate, my mom just grabbed onto whatever she could grab onto, which were his man parts. And um, as he was like trying to pull her weight with his man parts um, and yelping, the guy that was at the door who had the gun said, let go or I'll kill your daughter because my sister was there. So anyway, it was like, my sister was like traumatized for quite a while after that and we all were, and these guys were never caught, right? And they were part of our community, obviously. So more on Florida on vacation, my mom went to Kmart and she bought this BB gun, like this $10 BB gun. Uh, we tried it, it didn't even work, but we brought it back to Canada, which I found out that BB guns are actually illegal in Canada recently, which hmm. go figure. She would have this gun and she'd be like, you know, showing it off to people being like, you know, we got this gun, so don't mess with us. And I'm like, you got this thing and it has this power. It's actually protecting us in some way because people think we have a gun, but we don't really have a gun. Right. So it's like if somebody comes in and she pulls this thing out, it's like you're going to get killed. So I've always kind of like, again, it's like that vulnerability and that masculinity or that power and vulnerability. It's like you have this gun that you think will protect you, but it's like in the end, it might get you killed because if you pull that thing out and it doesn't work and it's a BB gun, which can't do anything. I don't know. That kind of always stuck with me. And then um, when we moved to Texas, I saw we we're going out to dinner. We we're in Dallas, really nice part of the town. These two gentlemen walking around with, at the time, they didn't know what they were, but they were AR-15s. And I was like, this is weird. And I had my little camera and I took a picture. I'm like, I think they're about to kill people. I'm not really sure what's happening. But they were part of a, a, a gun rights group called Open Carry Texas. So that's kind of like my entryway into that. And then that turned into a photographic project. Right. So at the time, I was actually like, I just want to know who these people are. So I want to ask them some questions, like, because I'm threatened. I know I'm feeling certain things, and I've never seen a gun like that ever in my life, like only on TV. So I went over, and I'm talking to them. I'm like, okay, they don't look like they're going to kill someone or hurt me in any way, shape, or form. Let me talk to them. And I'm like, oh, these are all right dudes, like, look like someone I'd be friends with, whatever. And they're like, yeah, come up to a rally and check it out, whatever. You can ask us questions if you want, whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, And then I'm like, yeah, if I can come take pictures, I'm Canadian. I don't really know anything about guns. I'm terrified of you. <laughs> can I come spend some time? And it's like, I think if you're coming at it from a point of understanding, they're always open. I mean, people are always open to explain their, their stance and their position. They don't feel like they're being judged in some way, especially afraid Canadians. They love them. I don't know. It's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. And then you also have another project about Elvis. Mm -hmm. Yep, Elvis, I was turning 40. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, wow, this person who died 40 years ago, you know, the year I was born, still has like this lasting pull across people all over the world, across people that weren't born when he was alive. Like, how does this, what is that? Like, how, how can you still be so attracted to something where it becomes part of your life, where it's like, you've got their image tattooed onto your skin or you know you travel the world like you're, you you save up to go to Elvis festival that's your travel you know okay. thing that's what you do every five years you get to go to Memphis or to Park Crawl or wherever to like some Elvis festival or where you take on their identity and you become you know an Elvis tribute artist where you know you, you, and, and it's kind of like that whole thing where you kind of take in this persona of this person but you make it your own and adapts and it's like Elvis tribute artists, like they all have their own things, they have their own fan bases. It's not like they're not a replica of Elvis, they're their own thing, mm -hmm. they're their own artists. It's kind of interesting. It's like, but again, it's like that why, like, what is that? And I'm getting really frustrated with, people, with it because it's like, I get, oh, he's such a beautiful man, or 
they sing so well or it's just like such a given person but whatever you get all these like generic answers I'm like come on man like but you've been coming to Memphis like for the past 20 years every single year right. like you got tattoos of him like you're crying I'm like come on there's got to be more than this. so I started asking people like uh, as a way to kind of get a little bit deeper to write letters to Elvis so I'd be like hey if you could write Elvis a letter and you would absolutely read it what would you say like, oh my god I don't know I'm like okay well if you don't mind I'm doing this project and I want to understand and I want to share it eventually can I give you this notebook go take as much time as you need and write all this letter that he's going to read so I just started collecting all these different letters from different people are you still working on that a little bit I think I'm done that's like with the, the gun thing it's like once I've got my answer it's like with the gun thing it's like okay it's gray I started off neutral ended up neutral right um Scared of it, but it's gray. You know, I respect people's rights if they're not breaking the law. It's like the Elvis thing. It's like I went uh, for the 39th anniversary, 40th and 41st anniversary. Met a lot of beautiful people. I'm like, came out of it not really understanding it again. It's like <laughs> there's no right answer. It's like it's different from everyone. For everyone again, it's like you know, some people it's for the music. Some people do it for the rockabilly culture because they're cool tattoos and cool hair or whatever. And other people do it because they're connected to another time whether it's family you know memories of watching Elvis with the grandmother or I don't know just kind of like a different time in America where it was a little bit less complicated you know you're gonna have cell phones and Instagram and whatever sure. yeah and so now you are working on a project about bullfighting but specifically bullfighting in LA is that do I have that right it's in California, um, so it's bloodless Portuguese bullfighting. As far south as LA County, there is a, a, an area which will um, have bullfighting, but that's been kind of dying off over the past few years. So I was looking into this a little bit earlier, bullfighting. So the, the bloodless bullfighting specifically is what you're looking at, because um, I guess standard bullfighting, if you want to call it that, is, uh, is illegal pretty much everywhere with the exception of, of Spain and Portugal at this point. Yeah, so what most people know in, in bullfighting would be, which again, ignorant me, um, 2009, I was in Spain and so this gorgeous, beautiful arena, I'm like, wow. And I was like, I've never been to a bullfight. I hadn't really thought through it. And it's like, bullfight we'll tonight. I'm like, oh, okay, like five euros, sure, I'll come, come back at seven. I'm like, awesome. Sure. And I was like, wow, this is intense. So it's like super intense. I'm like, okay. Wasn't mentally prepared for that. Uh, wasn't really into it. Um, didn't really think about it. And then like a couple of years later, whatever, they're talking about it becoming outlawed in Barcelona and, you know, in Catalonia. So I'm like, wow. I'm like, Portugal has bullfighting. I'm like, is that going to get, like, eventually, is that going to go away? Like, is that part of my culture that I haven't really explored that's eventually not going to be around? Like, if we have kids one day, are they going to know anything about this or whatever? It's like, it's already a dying sport, but like, I don't know. And that, then they realized I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, so in Portugal, so in Spanish bullfighting, you have, you know, the matador who kills the bull mm -hmm. on foot, gets the passes, whatever, and eventually kills, kills the bull with the, sport, uh, with the sword. In Portugal, there's no killing of the bull, but they do use the banderillas, you know, the things that they spike you on the back. Uh, generally, if the bull is a strong bull, from my understanding is that that bull gets to have a very nice life, gets to breed, gets to enjoy itself. So in Portugal, they actually fight on horseback. So the, if you look at them, they have like a like period clothing and it's kind of like nobility. So if you are part of the king's tribe or whatever, I'm totally not saying this right, but you would um, have these beautiful like majestic horses that are from the Lusitano uh, breed. They're kind of like these war horses that were bred to be brave and to you know go to war. And you would fight on horseback bullfighting was actually a way to develop those skills for battle and also to kind of show off those skills and obviously you would be a well-to-do person at the time you so on in Portuguese bullfighting instead of being on foot getting the passes you try to get those bandages on the back of the of the bull um in california again this idea of bringing your culture to a new place and then it morphs and adapts to the local taste and, and laws or whatever in california they actually use if you can see it let me see if it could so they actually put like a velcro strip on the back of the bull and then the banderillas actually have like a little velcro tip mm -hmm. um so the bulls don't get hurt but it's kind of interesting because 
in Portugal, they're stabbing you with this thing every time you, it's your first time encountering a human in that way. Every time you go up to the human, you get hurt. So you associate human pain, human pain. Uh, Here, you're trying to get the human and it's like, you tap me on the back, you're just pissing me off. So this bull's just getting more and more enraged throughout the fight. So in Portugal fighting, so then what's the finale? Like that sounds kind of boring. So the finale is a symbolic kill. So you have the cavalier on the horse and then the finale, you have a group of eight men. Um, there is a group of women for Cados in Portugal. Um, and the idea is it's a symbolic kill. So you try to get the bull to charge you and you try to wrestle it to a standstill. And that's a symbolic kill. So if you can wrestle it with your hands without any protection other than your friends, that's the end of the fight. It's a symbolic kill. You try to get it too quick, like at the end, you know, you wrestle it to a standstill. Mm. Um, so you line up and you try to get the bolt to come after you. So if you don't get it in the first try, you usually have to do it a few times and the, the humans get bloody, not the bull. So it's bloodless for the bull, but not for the humans. So you try to get the bull um, and they represent like kind of like the Portuguese cowboy, like the field workers. And they're the only group of bullfighters that actually fight um, as amateurs. I mean, they get bloodied, concussions, broken, whatever. Right. And I wish I hadn't thought about is, that, the fact that it's bloodless for the bull, but not necessarily for the, the matadors. Yep. And um, it's really interesting because it's like the, I'm really interested in the Percato groups. I mean, that's a, where I kind of get pulled because it's like, you're taking the most risk you're the ones who are actually getting hurt. The guys on the horses rarely get hurt, right? And it's like, you're an amateur. A lot of them are undocumented or don't have insurance. It's like, why are you willing to risk everything in something that you're really likely you're going to get hurt? And some people get hurt pretty badly. And it's like, that's what I've been kind of trying to figure out in this project is trying to get to that kind of like, why do you do that? So in my reading up on bullfighting earlier, I, I ran into kind of the origin of bullfighting actually had to do with a worshiping the bulls, but then sacrificing them, which kind of, I mean, not to say it completely put it together for me, but I guess when you think about when the bull did inevitably end up dying within the fight was actually kind of a sacrificial event. It's pretty wild to, to think about, I gotta say. Yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of like what they used to do in the gladiators and all that. It's like, you know, we always have this kind of like man versus beast thing. Like again, masculinity versus, you know, vulnerability, right? Like right. you're being masculine, but you're going to get your ass kicked. Um, even like the clothes, it's like, it's very masculine. And then it's like, you're wearing tights or you're wearing like, you know, lace and stuff. It's quite interesting. Like, again, I'm just trying to understand it. I'm not trying to judge it or whatever. There's a lot of respect for the animal, like for the bull. It's kind of interesting. Like, because I guess going into it, I'm like, we're just trying to kill these things. It's just kind of like this barbaric thing. And maybe it is, maybe it's not, I don't know. But it's like, I feel like there's a lot of respect for it. Like they take it very seriously. They respect the animal. And it's like, it's a sacrifice, but it's like this kind of unfair fight, I guess. Yeah, you're, you're, you're training your whole life and this bull's encountering you for the first time. So, but the bull also can kill you quite easily as well. And if you're, you know, bulls are really smart animals and they kind of figure stuff out really, really quickly. And that's why they only fight once because they'll figure stuff out very quickly. That's like this dance. Like a lot of them will refer to as like this dance or this ballet where they're kind of like dancing with this beast. And it's like kind of this beautiful thing. It's very spiritual for a lot of people too. Like in, in California, it's legal because it's tied to religious ceremonies. A lot of the bullfighting, they have it in Portugal, but a lot of it here in California, a lot of the immigrants came from the Azores, specifically from an island called Terceira. Mm -hmm. When they came here in like the 50s or whatever, they started bringing their traditions and all that. Um, but yeah, just in kind of thinking about the worship and the sacrifice, just how you were talking about how the bull was highly regarded, that that aspect of it, it seems like hasn't been lost. For me, it's not about getting the prettiest picture or whatever. For me, it's like, how can I spend enough time with something that I might not agree with, respect it, come up with a from something some deeper understanding of, of a human connection with someone and it's like and how do I share that with someone else like that's what I'm interested in otherwise it's like anyone else can take that picture like for me it's about that relationship that I have with that person or that group so it's like that's what I can contribute I'm not going to contribute the best bullfighting picture in the history of bullfighting but I can hopefully show you something that you've never seen before or feel something that you might not have felt 
or see some, maybe something in their eyes that is unexpected in your own kind of what you think about something. When like um, when the world opens up again, is there somewhere you would want to go specifically photograph bullfights? Ooh, bullfights. Make it even more fun. Not only can you travel, but you can travel back in time. Or... Well, truth, truth, the boring answer, and I'll wait for your or, uh, the boring answer is actually would just rather just photograph what I'm photographing now, like that's well, that's, what I'm interested in. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the fun answer would be like, it would be fun to go photograph like where Hemingway was watching, you know, the bullfights in Spain, just like hang out with him and photograph and kind of get his perspective on it before he wrote his book. So while we're, we're time traveling, if you could just mm -hmm. time travel just for fun, for any reason, is there a place, time, unbull related that, that you would pick? It'd be really cool to go back and see my parents, like my age, and like just mm. kind of hang out. It was kind of like, I don't know, just recently I started kind of thinking of them as like humans as opposed to like parents. Sure. So it'd be kind of just kind of cool to be like, what were you like at my age? Like, what were you into? And like, what did you do? And how did you talk? And like, what was it like having me as a kid or something? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know. I just, just think that'd be really cool to just kind of see your parents at your age. No, oh, definitely. About that. Yeah. So, so, I mean, maybe you kind of answered that, but if you were going to do that, would it be more um, back to the future style where they didn't know who you actually were or would you want to be able to introduce yourself as Daniel of the future? Interesting because if you do hey dad what's up it's like coming over from the future then he'd be like am I gonna have my hair still like what's going on right like tell me what's coming you know what are lottery numbers whatever and then you that maybe suck. convince him you're not crazy and I don't know. Right, yeah, versus, that too, sure. <laughs> versus if you just show up as some, I don't know, some other guy wanting to have a beer or something, then. Yeah, I think I think that would be cool, because then it's like, you're also not guarded, right? It's like, you don't want to like, oh, wait a minute, you're my future kid, like, I don't want you to see me doing this thing I'm not supposed to be doing. Like, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like a co-worker, like my my dad was a waiter at a, a bunch of restaurants in Toronto, so it's like, yeah, just be like a fellow waiter that goes to the bar afterwards and like has a drink with them. Right, yeah, yeah. you're the new guy yeah the new guy exactly yes. I've asked a lot of traveling questions and I've just recently started thinking about time travel because I don't know because there's no travel over all this time there's no travel so while we're imagining travel why not make it time travel why not it's like we might have to we feel like we've still got some time to wait hopefully not too long yeah. I know you were mentioning about going to Portugal. Hopefully you were planning for next year, but maybe the year after. We'll see how that all how that all works out. I, I do have a cousin who is li living in Lisbon right now and another friend that lives in, in Porto. So I was hoping to go in 2021, but I don't know, that might be a little a little soon. In in this past year, and have you Rewatched any old favorite movies recently that that stand Ooh. out to you? Oh, I got a good one for you. And I kind of knew a movie related question was coming up because I have watched your other shows. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, and if you're interested in the bullfighting thing, it's called Gord, G O R E D. Oh, um, it's a documentary. If you haven't watched it, it's incredible. I've probably watched this thing like maybe six or seven times. I'll probably watch it uh, six or seven times. Netflix. So. Uh, that or Prime, I'm not sure oh, it's Prime. one of those. Um, it's on one of those. And it's just really good. It's like a beautifully done documentary, uh, something I'd aspire to do someday. Just, it's a bullfighter who's like, got a wife and kid, and it's like talks about like, how I got into bullfighting through him and his wife. And it's just really beautifully done. And it kind of really goes into like, explaining this kind of passion. It's kind of one of those things where I'd watched it like before I got into this bullfighting thing and oh. I had a different meaning than it does now. Like I'm gonna watch it as I've been photographing this. I kind of watch it like every year or whatever, a few months or something. I'll kind of watch it again. It almost has like a different layer of like heaviness to it. Every time I see it, I, I feel like I understand a little bit more of where it's coming from. Cause again, it's like, you're like, what are you doing? You're like, you're yeah. crazy. And you can kind of really start understanding like a little bit of 
start getting more of a glimpse of like, okay, I get where this guy's coming from. Like, it's crazy in many ways. There's this kind of like, you really feel like that intensity and the, again, that preparing you know, the before and the after and the anxieties and all that stuff. Um, that's yeah. a really good one. And um, if you heard of the 66, 66 scenes from America, um, everyone, it's kind of made famous recently. Um, you know the Warhol Super Bowl commercial where he's like eating the Whopper for like two minutes. I don't know if you've heard of this, but anyway, it's like this whole thing where he eats a hamburger for he just eats a hamburger like a very banal thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like these sixty six scenes of America. And it was probably filmed in the eighties or nineties or whatever it was, and um, really cool documentary too. I really like that too. But kind of older stuff, but uh, I also really think that that um, anything that kind of stands the test of time is kind of that next level. So, so how about music when you are, um, I guess probably when you're out shooting photos, you wouldn't be listening to music because that doesn't really make sense. But when you're editing photos, is there, is there a soundtrack to that? It depends. Um, we have like a local NPR affiliate called KCRW in LA. So I usually have that on, I don't like house music or whatever, which is kind of cool, like kind of a bit more trancey kind of stuff, which I like. But yeah, I don't know. I just kind of um, recently I've been listening to like a lot of like 50s music and stuff, obviously because of Elvis and stuff. So I kind of like been kind of digging that time, Frank Sinatra, stuff like that. That's been kind of fun. Fado, as we were talking about before. Yes. And listening to that, because that kind of speaks to the bullfighting experience, I think, for sure. Which is basically Portuguese um, blues, as you had kind of explained it. Yeah. So in, in um, Lisbon, I don't know, I got this like magic pen. Uh, in Lisbon, <laughs> um, it's usually sung by women. So traditionally, it's usually like, you know, some lover lost or some somebody who died or whatever. It's like very kind of gut-wrenching, very emotional, like very strong visceral like singing. It gives me goosebumps even thinking about it. You, you had sent me a few links some time ago when you had introduced me to it. Are there a few particular musicians in that? Genre, genre you would um, suggest people check out? The, the original, the original OG, like the one, Amalia Rodriguez, that's, that's the one, that's, that's where you start and stop. I mean, she's like, she's the original, she's the Elvis of rock and roll, she's the Elvis of five I mean, she's, yeah, it's like, it's like, you can't not listen to her and then not, not, like, just not get goosebumps, like every few seconds, it's just chilling, right? It's just beautiful chilling. And I'm also experimenting with, um, we're talking about ukuleles again, one of these examples of something that, you know, started off in the island of Madeira, you know, the people came from the Azores to Hawaii and then different people play with it and it became a different instrument that resembles the original but now it's called the ukulele. So yeah. I'm like kind of been trying to learn how to play that very unsuccessfully, but I've been kind of- And looking. as you know, this wouldn't really be art in the raw if I didn't ask you if there was anything that you collect when we travel we get little pennies you've ever seen those little pennies that, that you like put a penny in like 50 cents and you like crank the machine yeah choose it mm -hmm. so I have like a little penny passport we have a few of those that we've been collecting over the years mm -hmm. every time we see one I get really excited because you don't see them very often so we have those sometimes we have like double the same thing because we forgot like we went back to the city like oh my god a penny machine you're like I already got this one pictures obviously art books photo books I was gonna say I know you love photo books yeah, I love photo books. Um, love my photo publisher friends and Chris Graves and Zatara and so many like good people doing good work. And well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Daniel. Thank you for having and, me. And thank you everybody for listening. If you like the conversation, please like, comment, subscribe. As I've been saying, uh, keep the conversation going. And Daniel, uh, before we say good night tell everybody your last name again because we're going to get this through everybody's head gone slaves <laughs> gonzalves <laughs> gonzalves or yeah. gonzalves if you want to really be proper <laughs> well I'm, I'm gonna eventually try and get down the the proper portuguese pronunciation i'll work on it anyways <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much and um, have a great thank night. You. And um, thank you so much.
we will talk soon. In Santa Fe, I hope. Yes, in Santa Fe. Or Portugal, wherever. Yes, Portugal, Santa Fe, meet in Santa Fe, fly to Portugal, something like that. Have a, have a good night. Thank you so much.